You will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. At the end of the test, you will be given ten minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one. Section one. You will hear a conversation between Harry and Andrea, two students who have just finished their final exams. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Example has been done for you. This time only, the conversation relating to the example will be played first. Hi, Andrea. How are you feeling now that exams are over? It's fantastic to have finished, isn't it? And to sleep in every morning. What about you? The student is happy to have finished exams, so you circle B. Now let's begin. Answer the questions as you listen. You will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions one to five. Hi, Andrea. How are you feeling now that exams are over? It's fantastic to have finished, isn't it? And to sleep in every morning. What about you? Well, I've been catching up on sleep too. But I've got a lot to do before I leave for England. Perhaps you could give me some advice. I've got a lot of things I can't possibly take back with me, but I don't know what to do with them. Well, it depends on what sort of things they are, and whether you're thinking of giving them away or selling them. Well, almost everything: furniture, the fridge, and other kitchen stuff that I bought from the previous tenant. But the new people have already got what they need, so they're not interested in buying stuff from me. I can't afford to give it away, but I'm not sure how to sell it all. Oh, and there are some clothes and books as well. Why can't you take them? The books are really heavy. It's so expensive if you exceed the airline baggage allowance, and the clothes. Just won't all fit in my suitcase. It's amazing how much stuff I've accumulated since I've been here. Anyway, I don't think I'll need as many summer clothes in England as I have here in Australia. I see. Well, there are several alternatives. First of all, you could put up notices around the university about the books. You know, on the notice boards in the student union building and in the economics department. Anywhere second and third year students will see them. People are always keen to buy cheap textbooks. Okay, what what should I say on the notices? Just put the titles, authors, and price you want, your name of course, and maybe put your phone number on those little tear off tags. That's a good idea. And what about the furniture? You could try doing the same thing, but usually students are away all summer. So they don't want to buy furniture now. Another place to try might be a second-hand shop. Someone from the shop will usually come around and give you a free quote, and then you can decide. But you don't usually get much money for that sort of stuff. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions six to ten.
Another alternative is to put an advertisement in the trading post. Do you know that paper? It comes out every week advertising things people want to sell. You have to pay to put the advert in and then hope people phone. Give them as much information as possible and if they're interested, invite them to come and have a look. The hard part is agreeing on a price. No, I haven't seen the trading post, but I should have a look at it. And I could advertise the fridge, the microwave and the furniture. But the kitchen stuff isn't really that good. You know, old cutlery, a few pots and pans and some plates and things. What shall I do with them? Well, another option is to donate the kitchen things to a charity shop. You know, like the Salvation Army or St Vincent de Paul. Why don't you get a second-hand shop to give you a quote first? Yes, I could do that. Find out how much they'll give me and then decide whether to sell them or give them away. But I've still got the clothes. A charity shop will take them too, as long as they're in good condition. And even though you don't get any money, at least you know that someone who really deserves some help has benefited. That's a good point. I'll advertise the expensive stuff, the furniture, and donate the clothes and kitchen stuff. Let's go and buy a trading post and you can help me write the advert. Well, actually, I'm interested in buying the fridge and the microwave, depending on the price, of course. OK, let's see how good you are at bargaining. That is the end of Section 1. You have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Section 2. You will hear part of a radio program about do-it-yourself house painting. First you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen and answer questions 11 to 14. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our weekly series on home improvements. Today's program is about do-it-yourself house painting. There's never been a better time for people who like to do their own interior house painting. Although people still lead very busy lives, Thanks to the availability of various new DIY materials, you can now decorate your home in a more efficient and a more environmentally friendly way. In 2009 alone, approximately 53 million litres of the paint that was sold in the UK were left untouched. That's enough to fill 21 Olympic-sized swimming pools. It's easy to overestimate how much paint you'll need to decorate your room if you use guesswork. And if you know exactly how much paint is needed, you avoid unnecessary waste. There are automatic paint calculators available now. Most of the major paint manufacturers provide them. Look on their websites or just Google paint calculator and see what comes up. Then simply measure the circumference and height of the room in metres. Enter this into the calculator, along with the type of surface you're painting, and it will tell you how many litres of paint you'll need. But if you do end up with leftover paint, you can donate it to an organisation like Community Repaint.
they will take the paint from you and redistribute it to local charities and voluntary organisations, so it goes to a good home. You can find more information about Community Repaint on communityrepaint, all one word, dot org dot uk. Now you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. Another way of avoiding paint wastage is to check you're completely happy with your colour choice before starting to paint. For example, you can get a small sample of the colour you're thinking of using, then paint a board and move it around the room so you can see how it looks against your furnishings and in different lights. Also, it's always better to buy high-quality paints because you get what you pay for. If you buy cheap paint, you might need to apply two or three coats to achieve the same coverage that you'd get from one coat of a good quality paint. You could also spend a week on a job that could have been done in a day or two. And consider the environment. Most paint manufacturers now sell water-based paints that don't contain harmful chemicals or give off harmful odours, so get one of these. You can also buy paint that's packaged in recyclable containers. There's a lot more choice than there used to be. You can only do a good job which will last if you prepare the surfaces thoroughly before painting. In fact, in many ways, if you want to do a professional-looking job, this is more important than the painting itself. If there are any cracks or patches of loose plaster, painting over them won't solve the problem. Take the plaster out and fill the holes, allowing enough time for the new plaster to dry. And you won't get a smooth finish if the walls are dusty or greasy so washing with water isn't enough. Use a solution of decorator's soap and rinse well with warm water afterwards. When you're ready to paint, we suggest you use a medium pile roller for walls and ceilings. A lot of people tend to use short pile rollers, but these give a patchy finish, and that wastes paint and time. Similarly, Long pile rollers can create a thick textured effect, which looks messy. The same goes for brushes. The stronger the bristles, the easier they are to wash and reuse. And as you've chosen a water-based paint, clean your brushes with cold water, because it's more energy efficient that way. As you're decorating, keep transferring small amounts of paint into a tray and keep topping it up when you need to. This reduces the chance of it being contaminated by dust and pieces of dirt. And finally, water-based paint doesn't have a lingering smell, so that's not an issue anymore. But it's airflow rather than heat that helps the paint dry quicker. So, to help finish the job in the quickest time, Leave your doors and windows open. The faster the paint is dry and the job finished, the quicker you can start enjoying your room. In tomorrow's program, I'll be giving some advice on... That is the end of Section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now, turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear two business studies students, Evelyn and Mark, preparing for a seminar presentation. Before you hear the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Well, I think the marketing of food would be a good topic. I read a very interesting article the other day about the Canadian food market. Hmm. I suppose everybody's interested in food, even if it's trying not to eat. Why Canada? I know that's where you come from, but isn't it just all North America, really? No. That's why I thought this article was interesting. Although lots of U.S. companies are well established in Canada, and vice versa, there are still subtle differences between the two markets. It says here, the Canadian market is definitely not a northern clone of the U.S. I like that. And it says that if you understand these differences, it can have a big impact on successful food marketing. So I know that Canada has a big French-speaking population in Quebec, is this what they're referring to? Not only French and English speakers, there are many different ethnic groups in Canada. It's really quite multicultural. For example, Toronto has large Asian and Italian populations, and Vancouver's got a large Asian population too. And, because Canada's population is small, these groups make quite an impact introducing new styles of cooking. So, you can see lots of unfamiliar vegetables and things in the markets, and new restaurants are opening every day. It's great if you love trying out new foods, as many people do. Which kinds of food are becoming popular? Well, some Asian food, I'd say, has been popular for quite a while, like Chinese. But now, Southeast Asian restaurants are becoming very fashionable. Then, there's Mediterranean, of course, such as Greek, Italian, and so on. But Caribbean and Mexican food is really taking off among young people these days. So are the supermarkets starting to stock the ingredients that are needed to prepare these foods at home? You know, all those unusual condiments and sauces. Yes, that's right. It's quite interesting going to the supermarket, isn't it? And noticing how they're introducing sections for foods of different nationalities. You can buy quite exotic products locally these days. The article mentioned that 80% of the Canadian retail market is controlled by eight major national supermarket chains, so that when they introduce changes, they can happen quite rapidly. OK. Well, how are we going to organise this seminar then? I made some notes on the trends in the Canadian market, about changing tastes, and also patterns for where food is consumed. I thought maybe we could summarize it into a chart or table and maybe use the overhead projector to present it. Good idea. Maybe I could have a look for similar trends and tastes in Australia and the UK for comparison. Let's have a look at what you found. Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now, as the conversation continues, answer questions 26 to 30. The most significant trend, it seemed to me, was that Canadians are definitely interested in healthy food. 
For example, did you know that salads are the third most commonly eaten food in Canadian restaurants? Really? What about organic food then? Is that becoming more popular? Yes, it's definitely moving into the mainstream compared to a few years ago. And a recent survey showed that four out of five shoppers said that they check the fat and nutritional information on the packet when they're deciding what to buy. What other trends did you find out? There's one change I noticed straight away when I was home last year in the meat department. You know, here the meat packaging says rump steak or four quarter chops and so on. Well, they discovered that most consumers these days didn't know what to do with these roasts and rounds and ribs. So the government approved a new naming system for cuts of meat, which is related to the required cooking technique. What a good idea! I've never really understood the difference between sirloin, rump, Round and all those names. So, how many new categories are there? Eight. There are three kinds of steak for grilling, for marinating, and for simmering. And then there's what they call quick serve beef for stir fries, I suppose. And premium oven roast, oven roast, pot roast, and stewing beef. It's a great idea, isn't it? I hope it catches on here. I agree. Any other trends that you thought were significant? Well, what's really interesting is what the article called mobile meals. In other words, more and more Canadians are eating meals away from home, but not just eating more junk food. They're projecting a 40% increase in snack food sales over the next three years, and the growth is coming from healthy snacks. You know, the ones that have less cholesterol and fat, such as muesli bars, health food bars. And those types of products. Apparently, in the food marketing jargon, they're called nutritious portable foods, which means healthy snacks. The other major trend is that young people are doing more of the food shopping these days, so marketing has to be aimed more at them, as well as more conventionally at the mother. Thanks, Evelyn. I think we'll have an interesting discussion about these trends and the comparisons with other English-speaking countries. I'll see if I can get some information about them to compare with yours, and meet you on Friday to put it together. See you then. Bye. That is the end of section three. You have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. You will hear a historian giving a presentation about techniques to identify the origin of handwritten books from the Middle Ages. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen and answer questions thirty-one to forty. My presentation today is on how the science of genetics is being used to shed light on the origin of manuscripts, anything written by hand, produced in the medieval period. That is, the period between the fifth and fifteenth centuries A.D. 
As many of you know, thousands of medieval handwritten books still exist today. Some of them have a clear provenance. That is, we know exactly where and when they were written. But the origin of many manuscripts has been a complete mystery. That is, until 2009, when geneticists started using DNA testing to shed light on their origins. But before looking at the new research, I need to explain something about the way the manuscripts were produced, particularly what they were written on. Virtually all were written on treated animal skins, and there were essentially two types. The first was parchment, which is made of sheepskin. It has the quality of being very white, but also being thin. It has a naturally greasy surface, which meant it was hard to erase writing from it. This made it much sought after for court documents in medieval times. The second type is vellum, which is calfskin. This was most often used for any very high-status documents because it provided the best writing surface, so scribes could achieve lettering of high quality. So, once the animal hides had been chosen, they had to be prepared. Where the right materials were on hand, the skins were put into large barrels or vats of lime, where they were agitated or stirred frequently. But if lime wasn't available, then the hides were buried. Both these techniques were designed to cause the hair to slough off and the skins to become gelatinous and therefore more flexible. The next stage was to put the hides on stretcher frames and pull them very tight. While on the frame, they were scraped with a moon-shaped knife in order to create a uniform thickness. For parchment, that was the end of the process. But for vellum, there was an additional stage where it was bleached in order to achieve the desired color. So, what does all this preparation mean for the quest to identify the origins of mystery manuscripts? Well, until recently, the only way historians and other academics were able to guess at origins was either through the analysis of the handwriting style or from the dialect in which the piece was written. But these techniques have proven unreliable for a number of reasons. It was thus decided to try to look at the problem from a different angle, to start from what is known, that is, the small number of manuscripts whose origins we do already know. Because these parchments and vellum are both made from animal hides, it was possible to subject them to DNA testing and to identify the genetic markers for the date and location of production. From this was created what is known as a baseline. The next stage was to test the mystery manuscripts, finding their DNA characteristics, and then making comparisons between the known and the mystery scripts. Genetic similarities and differences enabled the scientists to gain more information about the origins of the many manuscripts we had known virtually nothing about up to that point. Now you might ask, what are the potential uses of this new information? Well, obviously, it can shed light on the origin of individual books and manuscripts. But that's not all. It can also shed light on the evolution of the whole of the manuscript production industry in medieval times. And because that was such a thriving business, involving very large-scale movements right across the globe, the new data in turn help historians establish which trade routes were in operation during the whole millennium. Now, if anyone has any questions... That is the end of section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers. It's not a game, it's a red skin.